I'm going to confess my bias because I know most of the lead authors in the publications. The first book is a Springer publication by Sandy Lazarus, Power Identity in the Struggle for Social Justice. Sandy is someone who gave a lecture to me when I was doing masters in psychology in oh, 84 or yeah it was 1984 at WITS she was from UCT and Sandy is a well-known psychologist and a pioneer in community psychology in the country. This book is important. It's not as thick as the next book, but you would do yourself a disservice if you don't get this book and keep it in your shelves and rely on it in terms of the work you're doing, not only in terms of what's been discussed here, but generally it is an important reference book. So I'm going to call my old buddy, Sandy, to say a few words about her book. I have to start by thanking all the people who helped me to write the book over the last three years. And I'm not going to refer to who they are because there are lots of people, but particularly to Mohammed Sidat and Shanaz Safla, who were the editors of the series. This is part of the community psychology series, and there are at least three others coming out in the next 18 months or so. So um, I wish you well with the, with the rest of the books. Um, just, I just want to make a few comments about the book and then talk about the thread, the key which the title of the book actually expresses. But first of all, to say why I wrote the book. I was asked this morning, why did I write the book? I was actually recommended by the National Research Foundation. In fact, I was pretty much told that it was time I wrote on my own because for 30 or 40 years I've been writing and always in collectives. And I was strongly encouraged to write what they call a monograph, which was very uh, difficult to do. But I, and if I had time, I would share some of those difficulties. But that's not what I want to focus on at the moment. I was convinced by particularly students of mine and colleagues that it would be useful for me to write a story of my community practice and link it to theoretical issues that are central to community psychology so that students and lecturers could potentially use it to engage with the issues and the theories that we are called to uh, understand and use. In terms of what the book covers, I'm not going to go through the table of contents, but just to say that it focuses on uh, my practice, which is fundamentally about knowledge work and more specifically my research, uh, particularly action research, participatory action research uh, approach and policy development uh, research uh, over the years that I've been involved in, and then also teaching and learning because I've been in education for most of the time that uh, I've been in academia and in my community work as well education has been a central part of my life so that's the contents very broadly speaking but I start in the uh, what I did is I read I, I read I wrote the story of uh, almost 50 years of practice of community practice which started outside of the academia and then I learned about some of the theories about what I was doing. Um, and once I'd written the first draft, I looked back on it as one does with an autoethnography to look at what the threads are in the practice uh, that I was trying to highlight. And, I, and the title of the book, Power and Identity in the Struggle for Social Justice, emerged. It was not how I started. But what emerged in all my work, in all my practice, is that issues of power are central 
to all of my research and my teaching and education work and that I've had to, I've been forced to engage with understanding how power operates and how I am located within the power relations uh, in, in all spheres of my life. Um, and what I did to help me reflect uh, analytically about my experience of power and identity was to use a, um, a theoretical framework by Ramon, uh, well, Ramon Grosfugel, I can't pronounce the Spanish, um, who referred to the matrix of power. I think you know, we could use various frameworks to try and understand ourselves within power relations, but I found that a very useful um, framework because it helped me to identify the various areas, the number of areas where oppression can occur, where inequalities exist, where privilege uh, is enacted, uh, and where also resistance and transformation and empowerment can happen. And so what, I, what it helped me to do was to, was to look at all aspects of the power relations. The three that came out the strongest for me was race, and I'm a real South African in that sense. I am both damaged and built to be who I am because of South Africa and our apartheid history and the colonial history that preceded that. And so race has always been a key uh, area of analysis for me. Gender as well, various aspects of gender has also been, and ha as has been the class, social class issues. Uh, later on in my life, thanks to Chibani uh, Mangani, uh, uh, who asked me to chair the Commission on Inclusive Education, I was educated by the, the disability people's organizations on how people with disabilities experience oppression and exclusion. And I'm very grateful to that exposure because even though I haven't yet experienced disability, or I'm getting close to it from aging, um, and I mean that, um, but uh, uh, I was able to understand, I don't know if Leslie Swartz is here, but he spoke about how important disability is, and I definitely think that is an area that's important. There are also other areas, uh, sexual orientation, um, religion, uh, age, uh, language actually became quite a e key issue, recognizing that I'm English speaking, and what does that mean? Uh, and uh, also jargon, you know, the, how we exclude people from talking about these things with big words. Uh, and uh, not that the big words are bad in themselves, but it can be exclusionary if people are not sharing that communication. So it really helped me to understand uh, uh, myself, and, and, and basically what that forced me to do was be reflexive, uh, to use that uh, word that many of us use in our teaching, um, to identify how I am located I had to do self-reflection on how I am located within those various uh, aspects of power relations. Um, and uh, even if I don't identify with all of the various aspects clearly, because I am a product of an intersectional connections, um, I have, I've had to accept that other people see me in a certain way. And so in my work, I have to understand how I see myself, how I am, how I'm engaging with those power issues, but also how other people see me and what do I do about that. Um, and so I, in the book, uh, I spent a lot of time reflecting on myself and what that means for my practice. And uh, perhaps just to say, I'm nearly at the end, perhaps to say that uh, it's a, it's a very vulnerable space to be. Uh, I think we are calling on people to do this kind of thing, to bring to the consciousness our unconscious racism and other forms of oppression. Uh, but it's not, it, it's an emotional journey. Uh, and I've experienced it in different ways in my life, but writing this book uh, it was very intense in that way. And I think what I've learned from that is uh, I've been very lucky because I've been working with wonderful people who've given me feedback, who've helped me understand the theoretical aspects of that, who've helped me to grow through the difficult parts. Um, I've, and and I, I think if we're asking people to be reflexive and if we want our students 
to be reflexive, which I believe we should be asking. We need to provide the support. We need to find ways to help people to help each other and themselves, uh, and, and then in our practice to help others also to understand the dynamics that uh, uh, impact on our community development work. So, so perhaps uh, uh, when I was uh, in the throes of reflecting on these different aspects of power relations, the thing that became most important to me was what, how do I deal with all these different aspects of power in a simple way? I was looking for something that I could emotionally uh, uh, cope with and share in an education, in an educating context. And um, for me, it boiled down to the social justice agenda of restoring and affirming dignity of all. And I think if we can do that for ourselves and for our students and for the people we work with in the community, uh, I, and I know we've talked, it's been talked about today in different ways, uh, love and understanding, and, uh, and the word dignity has popped up quite a lot. Um, and I think that if we hold that value and that principle at the forefront, we can deal with all the different uh, aspects of power relations that can potentially turn into oppressive relationships. And that, helped me, that helps me, in wherever I am, to think, am I respecting myself? Am I restoring and affirming my own dignity? Am I doing that for the others who I am with? And am I helping my students to do that? And I think that's a, part of, a big part of what the training of psychologists and community psychologists should focus on. How do we practically uh, help people to restore and affirm dignity? So there are lots of other things that I also learned, but to me that the core of the challenge of dealing with power and identity in the struggle for social justice. And then just to end by saying that this, this is a personal story. It's Sandy, uh, my particular practice, although uh, the activities of, of knowledge work and research and teaching is core to what I think community psychology is about. Um, but, it's, but it is a personal, it, it's, it's one story. And I'm, I hope, not that you think that my story will change your life or guide, guide you to do something differently, but that, that we would as lecturers help uh, and as practitioners help others, help ourselves and help others to go on a similar journey where we identify uh, who we are and what the basic values and principles are that we want to affirm and enact in our community psychology work. So thank you. The different uh, areas that have been looked at, particularly in research and teaching, uh, which is a core of the academic enterprise. So I'm going to ask uh, Ronell and Pat to speak to their book. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to speak uh, this evening. Um, Rob and I are going to alternate a little bit. Uh, wow. 27 tractors, four years. Um, we are really happy with the product, although we got uh, uh, quite a bit of pressurizing from authors uh, because it had to be listed on the NRF lists. So we got it out December 2018. Um, this book covers 27 chapters, eight themes across broad areas within higher education. Um, it's numerous established academics and students, master students who have contributed meaningfully to this book. I think I want to say one thing about what this cover means. And then I'm going to ask Rob to talk a little bit about the title and we'll alternate. You know, all of us do books at some of the everyday things that we expected to do. And my understanding of community psychology is that together with others, we create platforms for others to flourish. This is exactly what we've done with this cover. We've asked matric students, we've given them the title of the book, and we asked matric students to do 
a drawing that depicts transforming transformation in teaching and research in higher education. And Deneo Makurani's cover was chosen to be the face of our book. I asked her to be here this evening. She's currently a second year uh, BA student at UCT. At the time she did this, she was in matric. So it was one way in which this book becomes something else for someone else. Let me say something before I ask you to say why transforming transformation. 25 years post 94. <clears throat> we have seen transformation being a corporate tick sheet. Transformation has been in higher education in South Africa and abroad, I may add. And of course, this is important. It has been a demographic numbers game. But of course, transformation goes beyond that. Rob, you can say what, we, what we did for with transformation. In the sure, book. yeah. Thanks, Renal. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that I've been to the, the sessions in the, this conference this afternoon. And one of the things that, that um, has been focused on quite a lot is the idea of engaging with agency and doing research which engages with people as active agents so we can hear and understand how they construct and experience the worlds around them. And I think that the problem that, in a way, that, that Lanel was alluding to with dominant understandings of transformation, certainly as they appear in higher education, is that they tend to be focusing on getting the demographic representativity right, okay, in terms of numbers. That's really important as a means of redress. That has to happen, but on its own, it's not enough. Transformation has to be much more than this. Surely transformation, and this is one of the, the points I think that we make and our contributors make in this book, surely transformation has to be informed by how different and diverse students actually experience life in universities. You know, it's no good simply you know, making the demographics right and you're getting the numbers right um, because it doesn't tell us how diversity is actually lived and experienced in certain contexts and universities. And that's what the, the pieces are, are kind of, that the, we, the, contra the contributions are particularly arguing for or exemplifying, uh, a sense that, that transformation is about transforming universities into sites of, of sociological and, and, and uh, anthropological and political research, okay? That, that we need to, I mean, I think in my experience in, in doing research in universities, I have to work hard at getting institutional permission to do research. It's seen as something that's not normal to do research in universities. And yet, in the context of transformation, we have to be doing research. Transformation needs to be informed by how different diverse students actually experience the university. So I think that's one of the key themes in the book. And also, um, we're interested in thinking about the kind of pedagogic implications of research. You know, so how, how research can inform what's taught and how it's taught. How can we develop relationships with, with our students which, which engage with them as, as, uh, as, as researchers themselves, encouraging them to research their own lives and identities. And so blurring the kind of the boundaries, if you like, between pedagogy and research. And I think, again, that's another aspect of the book. I, I think um, I'll just give you a flavor of the kinds of uh, chapters that you may, be, or the kinds of themes that you may be seeing in this uh, book. Um, the publishers um, do have copies at the back. Um, there are eight broad themes, transformation and scope and limitations, researching material and symbolic spaces on campus, at home or not at home, raising concerns about forms of othering on and off campus, doing gender and heterosex on campus, and so forth and so forth. But let me give you just two examples of chapters. In the theme, researching symbolic spaces, we have Vanessa looking at discussing 
graffiti about difference, or as some people call it, diversity, on the toilet's walls of student unions in campuses. This is the nitty gritty of everyday life on campuses. And we see how that conversation goes. And I certainly know at my institution, many institutions, people talk about courageous conversations. But in fact, courageous conversations are happening if we look very carefully, in this instance, toilets. Another example from a student, a postgraduate student at Stellenbosch University. Why did you choose to sit here? Same race, friendships, friendship groups. We, in fact, in this chapter, we take you, I told um, our VC, Prof. de Villiers, he must read that chapter because this chapter takes us by the hand and makes us see what we don't normally see. When we look at the spatial organization, who sits where and what the engagements are. It's these kinds of nitty gritty of everyday life on campuses. Now, of course, this is not only about Stellenbosch University, although we put nine chapters in it and we named the university. Um, this covers nine institutions in this country. And a third of the contributions come from psychologists. So I really want to applaud that today. Some of them who are here, Capano, Tammy, Shossi, Floretta, and the students have contributed. I myself did an autoethnography about race, language, and space, and talking about my own navigation through education, primary, secondary, and higher education from a small fishing village one and a half hours outside Cape Town, an Afrikaans fishing village. And I started a talk um, in the sociology department last year saying, I would not be a professor at this university today. In order to be a professor at this university today, I had to give up my mother tongue as Afrikaans. So, secondly, so I'd like to, to, to talk about this not only as a book written or contributed to be by, by psychologist, but that is interdisciplinary. It constitutes a contribution from the humanities, which has perhaps provoked Crane Sowardin, who writes the foreword in this book, to say this is a deep analysis of the modern elite university in South Africa. And I think here in lies the ethnographic value, the complexity of identity. It's not only about race. It's not only about language. It's not only about gender. But it's the way in which those intersect and the way in which those help and hinder opportunities for students and staff to in fact navigate the sometimes treacherous and sometimes enabling environments of higher education institutions today. Rob, maybe you can talk a little bit about the process sure. of the book. Sure, and, and I will, and, and just to pick up on what you're saying there, I mean, I think that, that Ronald's right, that there's, uh, the contributors come from a range of different backgrounds. You know, psychology certainly is very well represented, sociology, cultural studies, English. Uh, yeah, and, and I think that but what brings them together, what they have in common, is a concern to understand the complexities of how, of how mainly students experience and construct their lives and navigate their lives. And coming from different approaches, different perspectives, I think that, that really adds a special kind of dimension to it. I think, I think also what I, what I want to say, that another thing in relation to transformation is that 
the, the sort of attempt to to engage with with variables like like Renal was saying, like, like gender, uh, race, class, age, etc. Um, not not as adjectives, okay, which describe who someone essentially is, but rather as verbs, okay? How do we do gender? How do we construct ident our identities? How do we engage with others? How do we construct relationships, etc.? And 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 I think that's you know that 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 that's part of the transformation okay, of the book in, in terms of how the kind of methodological approaches we take and how we we understand these categories. Um, and, and just to add to, again to what you're saying, I think that that there's, there's two or three chapters in the book under a section called "Feeling at Home, Not at Home," and these chapters uh, focus on residence accommodation in different residences and how certain students in these residences feel quite out of home, okay, both metaphorically and and, uh, and literally. Uh, one would imagine that residences are places which are supposed to be home from home, but they're not experienced that by many students. And there's really powerful examples of this, looking at, again, lesbian students and their experiences of residence accommodation, Rhodes University, also students at Stellenbosch University uh, being expected to, par to participate in activities which they feel uncomfortable about doing, certain forms of dance and things like this, and how they, they feel marginalized in these spaces. There's very specific examples uh, provided and with very important implications for thinking about transformation. Um, yeah. So to conclude, um, what would we like this book to do? Because books aren't, you know, um, you know, the, 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 post, the post humanists will say that books are alive, and in this instance, in this instance, we'd really like this book to be alive. We'd like this book to be a discussion point, and for people who read it to interrogate their own experiences in relation to what they read in the book. So thanks very much, um, and we hope you enjoy the evening and the book. So here we stand before you, three of the 30 women. And in fact, we have another who is also responsible, Kamal Chetty, who is also responsible for this book. Uh, we have Rampella Rampella, as Sat says, also part of the book. 30 women. How did this happen? Where were they all these years? How did they appear all of a sudden? Now, we know for a fact that for a long time we have been somewhat marginalized and kept on the fringes. Why? Only you will know. Um, we know our power, as the book says, lies within yourself. That is your power. And that is a power we found within women who have not been spoken of, who have the, at times made to be silent, but we've gathered all of them to have their voice again. And that is how, through circles of memory, we brought women together in the hub cities of Johannesburg, of Cape Town, and of Durban, where we were centered. It was a kind of long process, but the process was long but yet short because some of them, lots of people didn't expect this book to come out. Even the writers themselves were quite shocked. Uh, and here it is, right in front of you, for you to enjoy. We also, it was time to remember. It is time to remember. Remember those who have contributed to the struggle. We dedicated this book to four women in particular. And they were Mahware, Winnie Mahware, who was the first woman president of a political organization called Black People's Convention, BPC. Then we have with us, well, the daughter of Buyelwa Mashalava. She was the first woman who held a secretarial position amongst all the men within Sasso, 
who brought together the women to articulate what they felt. We had Namsisi Cry. Namsisi Cry was a cultural activist, a woman who was vibrant in leadership training. And she, her daughter also, Ayanda Kuzwaya, also writes in this book. So the level of consciousness went from the, those days to what the young ones today had to write in the book. And then, of course, we had Debs Machova. And Debs Machova's maxim was, and that was very, very interesting, she says very clearly that, and her belief was, a nation's political maturity is measured by the political awareness of women. And that for us was absolutely important. And she was our leadership trainer and a person who was in charge of literacy training, which we need very badly today. Um, the, the stories are really a reflection of the multifaceted roles we as women freedom fighters played within the deadliest period of the apartheid regime. And of course, in this book lies the impact of banning orders, physical and psychological abuse, death in prison, torture, incarceration, being held incommunicado and in solitary confinement for lengthy periods. We persistently stood up and articulated a condemnation of a system that tore into the fabric of family life and community life. And if we look around us, nothing has changed. So the book has its relevance even today. Our stories also reflect how we defended our human rights with, and I think throughout and I think Sandy has talked about it throughout the sessions this morning. We talked about the pride, the dignity, but we also talk about self-esteem, self-image, and having a positive identity. Again, this identity question will crop up in one of the readings today. The, from the cover, you will see that the narratives actually strongly show how power lies within ourselves. Uh, I think Sandy, there seems to be some similarities across the books. Um, and our experiences led to an introspection and reflection of our beliefs, our attitudes, but most importantly, our values. Over time, we, we realized that it was black consciousness that laid the foundation for us to rise up against racism, sexism, classism, patriarchy, and all forms of social injustice. The, one of the writers and uh, editors of the book, Shamim Mir, talks about what in her, in her book, in her story titled, Being Black, Feminist, and Socialist, she says, our ideas, our consciousness, plays powerful roles in how we see ourselves and the world. Our consciousness influences what we see as possible and how we act. Both black consciousness and feminist consciousness influence me in very deep ways. Both emphasize starting from personal experience. And remember, our stories are both personal and political because we believe that the personal is political. And I think Seth spoke about that earlier on. And the political is personal. Both assert that systems of oppression are perpetuated through getting the oppressed to believe they are less than. And that liberation includes ending this mental slavery. You'll find a very good quote on mental slavery at the end of the book. Making, and most important, making changes within ourselves. It's nowhere else. These messages are pertinent today 
with current struggles of Me Too, Black Lives Matter, fees must fall more than ever. Now I want to leave you with Nazir Re, who will share her personal experience and her self-realization of her personal identity. So good afternoon. I hope you are not getting very hot and tired, and I hope you still have time to listen to us. I want to thank Sam for her courage, her vision, her energy, her humility in how she encouraged us to get pen to paper and to write the 40 of us that contributed to this book. And I would very much encourage you all to read the book. We heard earlier about transformation and I want to say there is nothing as important as self-transformation. 50 years ago, yes, it was 50 years ago, I had the unique opportunity to have my future shaped and changed by Steve Biko when he came to visit my school at Inanda Seminary. So, I want to thank him. I want to thank Mampele Rampele who's standing here. I want to thank Sam. And I want to thank the many women who are no longer among us. Among them, as you heard, Debs Machoba. And I want to particularly also thank a very close friend of mine, Peggy Lamini. All of them have passed, but we remember them. It's a time to remember. So here I was, a 16-year-old. I meet Steve Biko. He says, what is your name? Charlotte, I answered. What is your name? He asked again. Charlotte, I answered, confused. What does your mother call you? Nozizwe, I answered, still confused. That's your name. So I have Steve Biko to thank for reminding me who I was at a time when I was struggling with a name whose meaning I didn't know. I was in my senior year at high school and had applied to study medicine at the University of Natal, Black Section, also known as UNB when Steve in Bantu Bigo, Steve, and Bani Pijana, founders and leaders, co-founders and leaders of the Black Consciousness Movement in South Africa, came to visit my school. The year was 1970, a momentous period in the political history of South Africa. After years of suppression of the national liberation movements, students were picking up the cudgels of struggle in pursuit of freedom. The South African Student Organization that was formed in 1968 was claiming its place as a black-led student movement at universities around South Africa. My teachers, and I thank them, had arranged this visit to our school as part of raising our political consciousness and awareness. In those days, blacks were required to have Christian names, and that is the reason I was called Charlotte an English name. Growing up, I had learned to pronounce this foreign name, but when I went to complete my primary school at a nearby school, Fairview Mission, they made me change its pronunciation. The people at Fairview believed they were more civilized than us at Magog. Although spelled C-H, Charlotte is pronounced as if it was S-H. So when I went to Inanda Seminary in 1966, and they asked me my name. Of course, I mispronounced my name and said I was Charlotte. And the girls were so angry with me because I was not only mispronouncing my own name, but that of two other girls at the school who had the same name. It is said that oppression is complete when the oppressed assume the identity of the oppressor. In asking me for my African name, Bigo's purpose was to remind me who I really was, 
He wanted me to regain pride in my identity and the name my mother called me is who I really am, the core of my identity. The movement was about blacks reclaiming their rights and pride as an essential part of their emancipation, to be able to see others and engage with them as your equals. You needed to acknowledge and embrace your own identity. Asata Shakur, I think you know her son, deals with the critical need for awareness of young oppression as a step, of your oppression as a step towards liberating yourself. She observes, and I quote her, the less you think about your oppression, the more your tolerance for it grows. After a while, People just think oppression is the normal state of things. But to become free, you have to be acutely aware of being a slave. To be free requires an understanding of internalized oppression and self-doubt. We had been taught that to be black meant we were not fully human. We had internalized us and believed we were destined to remain the underdog. Some blacks had tried to change their situation by assuming a pseudo-white identity in the way they looked, dressed, spoke, and behaved. Some even took up the exempted native status, which black people with money and education were allowed to apply for. They didn't have land. The land was taken away, but at least they had education. This was a fake attempt to co-opt some blacks onto the side of the oppressor. Some of these people even adopted white surnames like Davidson and Hrodbom. As hard as they tried, black people were reminded that they could not be part of the chosen race. We needed to unlearn all of this and believe that we could free ourselves. The slogan, black men, you are on your own, was a great part of that journey. And I want to end by repeating to you a slogan I learned those many years ago, which I think we still need today. Say it loud. Say it loud. Say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. So we had to say that to remind ourselves that we were whole and to be proud of who we were, of who we are. I never thought, as I finish, we would need black consciousness today as much as we do. And I'm reminded, in fact, that liberation is not an event. Liberation is a process. Our youth today is angry. Our youth are self are alienated from self. And I think it is our duty to remind them to stand tall and, sue, and say who they are and how proud they are to be who they are. Thank you everyone for listening. So speaking truth to power brought with it reactions of violence. Many of the women in fighting injustices perpetrated by the system had to face the wrath of the state. The will and determination not to relent to the brutal physical and psychological attacks by the security forces comes from the strength within. The Filio Mulatto, she brings to you the acts of violence on the body and the mind. This was a story against Anjani Punan, who in her story still stands strong and centered. But let me tell you, Rafilwe also has her own story about who is your parent. And she says, her parent is you. So I call upon Rafilwe. Thank you. Auntie Sam. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Auntie Sam. Um, before I go get into Anjani's story, I just um, I want to just highlight this is not the first time I've collaborated with Auntie Sam. Um, the first time I was 12 years old, and she and my mum, uh, when she was still alive, uh, Vuyalo Mashalaba, were contributing to a Women's Day event at ML Sultan, I think, in Kwazulu Natal. Um, and I 
performed a poem with them at that time. So um, I guess all to say, in the spirit of the book, um, in addition to what Auntie Sam has said, uh, to me, women in the center of leadership is nothing new. So it's quite strange to step out of my home into the world and see it as it is. My, my mother was, and her six sisters were raised by a powerhouse single woman when, she, when my mom was four. Her father passed away and she, her mom raised seven women. My father, Justice Moloto, was raised by the powerhouse that is Ellen Kuzwayo. It's just not a strange thing. We had aunties like Auntie Mampilla around all the time. Uh, so it, it's, it, I have to say it's... I'm very grateful, Auntie Sam, for the op 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 opportunity uh, to convene again with a set of powerhouse women. <clears throat> to read from Still Strong and Censored by Anjini Punan. Amidst a crowd of fellow students, I walked out of the magistrate's court with my father. I was immediately rearrested. The arrest was made so discreetly that even my father, walking beside me, did not realize that I was no longer next to him. He eventually found me in a police building, surrounded by officers. I still remember the myriad, quickly changing expressions on my father's face. Pain, shock, horror, and disbelief. Stripped even of our ability to protect each other, we could only express our love and concern for each other with our eyes before I was led away by the policeman. I will never forget how painful this was for both of us. I was now detained at John Forster Square under the Internal Security Act. I was held there at night, but during the day, I was picked up by Colonel Hastick in his red car and transported to Protea Police Station, where he interrogated me and beat me with a tapered hosepipe in the presence of his assistant, Peterson. Hastick was a huge, strong man, more than double my size. My body was bruised and painful. My tackies, laces removed, made an unforge unforgettable flip-flop sound when I walked. Nor will I forget the relationship between the smell of rooibos tea and beatings. They discussed, uh, excuse me, the smell of rooibos tea with trauma. Haystick and Peterson drank rooibos tea on, and on most days, between sips of tea and beatings, they discussed my body in sexual terms, rating its attractiveness and its demerits. The interrogators flitted constantly between gently coaxing me into becoming a paid informer and sudden violent outbursts of physical and verbal anger. This was intended to shock and destabilize me into submission. The questioning and beatings focused on eliciting an admission that I had plotted treason. I received particularly intense beatings in order to identify Yunus Balim, a fellow activist. Throughout the interrogation process, I had no agency or control over my body. The only aspect of myself I could control was my mind, and spirit. I screamed when they beat me, but never broke down, cried, submitted, or begged them to stop. I have lived my life consciously, resisting that which diminished my sense of self, my dignity. I lived life refusing to accept apartheid oppression, but I also rejected the patriarchal oppression that stemmed from within our own ranks. I share my story here alongside the stories of many others as testimony to the human spirit a spirit that can triumph over adversity and oppression in all their forms. Thank you. It's what you do with it and how you take it forward that matters. So I, I'm hoping that you all will be present and will look forward to tomorrow's session. Thank you. So, uh, I think give another round of applause to the women who have done all the three books. Just on a personal note, I also have problems with rooibos because that's what we were given in prison. Uh, Haystick. Haystick uh, is around somewhere. He's a minute person now, but his brother used to be the financial guru on Radio 702 until he was outed for being corrupt. You know, I, I think this country has come a long way because amongst us live our torturers who we have not acted against. And perhaps it's because we've not had a revolution. We are experiencing that struggle within. 
So, as the good book says, and some of you may believe in it, um, drink, eat, and be merry, for tomorrow there's another day. And over to the UWC Jazz Band.